Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to New Books in Psychology. I'm Jeff Adler, speaking today with John T. Meyer. John is a psychotherapist at the Cambridge Therapy Center. Today, we are discussing John's new book, The Disabled Will, A Theory of Addiction, published by Rootledge Press in April 2024. In his book, John puts forth a novel vision of addiction as a fundamentally political problem that requires political solutions. This vision sees addiction not as a cognitive defect, but rather as a disability of the will that requires proper accommodations. John, thanks for joining me today. Uh, Pleasure, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So in many ways, this book is a response, is a reconceptualization of our how we speak about addiction. So to make sure our audience on a level playing field, how would you describe the kind of current addiction landscape to which this book is responding? Yeah, so so it's, it's a nice way of framing the question. So as your listeners, a lot of people know, there's a lot of debate about what addiction is, how to think about addiction in the sort of philosophical and kind of psychological landscape that I'm speaking to, one debate is whether addiction is disease or not. So there's a way of understanding addiction as a disease that's very influential in psychiatry, but also influential among a lot of people, you know, in recoveries uh, from addiction. So there's like a broad-based support for thinking of addiction as a disease. And then a lot of philosophers and also psychologists think actually addiction is kind of unlike a disease in many ways. Um, it seems to be responsive to reasons and incentives in a way that diseases aren't. So there's this debate, is addiction a disease or not? So I guess the initial uh, motivation for the book was kind of addressing this question or kind of uh, offering a different framing of of addiction, which doesn't uh, focus on the question of whether it's a disease or not. It focuses on a slightly different question of whether it's a, it's a disability. So, okay, before we get to the disability hypothesis, I want to unpack something that you were very careful about in your book, and I found extremely helpful, which is this argument that the idea that addiction is a disease is both descriptively false, like it doesn't hold up to scrutiny, and it's not, I think, what you call a useful myth. Like in practice, it doesn't work well. So can you unpack both those claims? Definitely, yeah. So so, so there's, there's so on the descriptive claim, so there's a bunch of data. Um, so Gene Heyman has a great book on this um, called Addiction, a Disorder of Choice, which kind of summarizes a lot of data. But it looks like people kind of, quote unquote, age out of addiction. So people will meet the criteria for a substance use disorder in their 20s and 30s. And then as they get into their 30s and 40s and, you know, they get mortgages and they get kids, they 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 reduce their use and no longer meet the criteria for substance use disorder. So a very common pattern, not everyone. But a lot of people meet that pattern. And that's very much unlike a disease. It's not, Diabetes doesn't work like that. Alzheimer's disease doesn't work like that. People don't spontaneously on their own, quote unquote, get better. So it doesn't have the, the, the sort of pattern of a disease. And then there's sort of micro level things. So you offer people gift cards for refraining from their substance of choice um, for a week, for two weeks. And people respond to these sort of incentives quite powerfully. So there's a lot of data suggesting people, even with allegedly overpowering addictions like cocaine addiction, can can with can refrain from using cocaine for significant periods of time in response to relatively small cash incentives or what you or I might call reasonably small cash incentives. So all this is pointing to this different picture of addiction on which it's a more rational choice rather than a disease. And I myself don't really endorse that view of addiction, but but a lot of people have argued that this data should move us away from addiction as disease to addiction more as a rational choice. To the second part of your question, yeah, so you might say, so there are a bunch of ways of responding to this. One way that's very powerful to me, because my book, um, I mean, in general, my approach is to give a lot of deference to the to the opinion of people who themselves have addictions. And that, in a way, has a final say. And I take seriously the fact that the disease model has a lot of currency in recovery communities. And for a lot of people, it's a very important narrative of how to understand their own recovery. 
So I say, well, maybe this is it's kind of a useful fiction or a useful myth, even if it's not literally true, according to some psychologist definition. Still, it's a way of framing addiction um, that's helpful for a lot of people and we should retain it. And that the argument there is a bit more um, indirect, but I think I'm also not sympathetic. I think ultimately we should reject that as well. I think conceiving addiction as, as disease often has stigmatizing effects um, and is not in general um, the best way of framing it, especially once we have an alternative story like the one um, I offer uh, in the book, but that sort of moves us to the to the, to the question to the positive view of addiction. So I'm I'm reluctant to embrace it as even as a as a as a idealization or as a myth about addiction. Okay, that helps. So before we move into the positive view, I did actually want to. One interesting thing is that, and you, you sort of touched upon it in your answer there, which is to a naive person, there seems to be something charitable about the disease view, at least compared to a view that's just like addicts just behave in bad behavior. It's just sort of like, I think what you call it morally, like reprehensible behavior. So can you sort of go back a little farther and say how the disease view emerged and you know why it still might be a little more sympathetic to the addict than the view that came for it, but why you still see it as sort of stigmatizing. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. So, and my general view of addiction is one on which I guess like the, I've, the arc of moral progress bends slowly, but it bends for <laughs> justice or whatever. That, like, I think we're we're in this. We're like, I think we're very, very slowly improving our understanding of addiction over like decades and centuries. And so, quite right, the disease model I think is objectionable um, in the ways I've just outlined. However, it's much better than what it replaced. So, so, so what it replaced um, seems to be, and it's tough to find people who really hold this this view, like in the in the literature, even in the older literature, at least to my knowledge. But there's this view on which addiction is, in some sense, a moral failing. So, addiction is bad behavior in some sense, a bad that's revelatory of a bad character that people who have bad character, they engage in sort of viceful actions like stealing, like adultery, but also like the excessive use of alcohol, tobacco, and narcotics. Um, so it's this vice. And how should it be treated? Well, it's a vice, and it should be treated by moral approbation. And when it leads to crime, um, it should be treated with punishment. So this is the legal or moral view of addiction. And the disease model emerged in the 20th century as a sort of um, um, uh, uh, improvement on this view, a rejection of this view on being like, no, that's the wrong way of thinking about it. Addiction, we should not be treating addiction as a moral failing to be treated in the courts. Rather, it's a sort of medical failing or medical issue to be treated in hospitals and clinics. And we should not be so focused on blaming people with addictions, but rather with helping them. And I think that's great. I, I also do not wish to blame people um, with with addictions. And in that sense, I think the disease model is a step forward um, uh, in many, many ways. It's like a transitional phase, I think, in our understanding of addictions, how I would see it. So lots of good, much better than what it replaced, despite the the concerns about, the, about it that I've raised. Okay, cool. I think that brings us all up to speed. Yeah. Then now let's bring us to this current, this current moment. How do we, to use your term, how do we bring the moral arc of progress in the topic of addiction um, even farther? What let's let's in broad strokes, what are you? What's your endorsement? What do you think we? How should we see addiction? Yeah, and so 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 one way of thinking is it, it's kind of in a way sidestepping this debate, like not saying it is or isn't a mm -hmm. disease, although maybe we'll eventually circle around to that. So, but rather, well, what what is addiction? Like what category does it fall into? Just if you're coming at this naively. So there's this view in the law. I mean, in, in the US it's been um, in the law since the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act and a lot of other um, countries treat addiction this way in the law um, as, a, as a disability. So addiction is treated in, in a lot of US law and a lot of international law as a disability. What's a disability? We'll get into that. But at first approximation, um, 
blindness and deafness are core examples of disabilities. So the thought of the book is, the, the initial thought of the book is we shouldn't at first pass at least think of addiction as a disease or a brain disease like Alzheimer's disease as people often do. Rather, rather we should think of it as a disability um, like blindness or deafness. Um, and crucially, and this will come out more as we talk about the positive view, to have a disability is not to be bad in some way or to be defective in some way. Disability, I think I follow a lot of disability activists here. It's just a neutral difference. You know, being blind or being deaf is just to be embodied in a different sort of way and to experience the world in a different sort of way, a way that's often discriminated against, but is in of itself neutral. So thinking of addiction as disability moves us to this much more neutral descriptive conception of what addiction of what addiction is. Okay, I want to make sure that we return to your point earlier about how you went from the courts to the the to the medical facilities, but we're at now. But before we get there, actually, I think that's a very very useful way to sort of track this whole thing. But let's just first make sure we unpack this kind of view of addiction. So. Okay, so it's a disability. What is it a disability of? So yes, yeah, so that's, so I think the big picture thing is addiction is a disability. And that's, so in the way the book is saying, we should take that view seriously and think about its implications. Um, and the implications are quite broad. And then within that, there's a, there's a more kind of philosophical question that you raise. So what kind of addiction, what kind of disability is it? It's not in the case of blindness and deafness, we have some rough sense of what the disability is. Um, what is it in the case of addiction? So, so my view is that addiction is basically a disability of, of the will. Um, so the will I think of following the philosopher Michael Brathman um, is like a faculty we all have for forming plans and making choices and sticking to our plans over the long term. So this is something we human beings and maybe other animals do. Um, and in people with addictions, that faculty works somewhat differently, especially with regard to their plans, with regard to certain substances or activities. So addiction is in the first place a disability of the will. The will works a bit differently in people with addictions. Not worse, but differently. Okay. And so to kind of continue along with this analogy from addiction to be more like blindness or deafness, yeah. as opposed to, in the case of disabilities, as opposed to Alzheimer's, diabetes, as the case of um, diseases. So again, sort of like the naive reader, from a moral standpoint, I like where we're going. But one, you know, question that came up for me personally is, for example, but doesn't, uh, anecdotally, doesn't it feel a little different in that we associate people can be vul more vulnerable for addiction, for example, when they've experienced great recent hardship in life. And so, uh, you know, to my knowledge, blindness and deafness aren't like that as much. They aren't sensitive to like very events in, in the environment as much. So how, how can we like sort of unpack that potential contrast or is that just not a real contrast? No, it is, it is very much a real contrast. I mean, I don't know about the about the recent hardship data, but but I mean, in in like people who've experienced um, a sort of what are called adverse childhood childhood experiences, kind of trauma and other things, are do seem to be more prone to um, addictions, which is which is not doesn't seem to be the case um, uh, in blindness or deafness. So I don't so this might well be so. I mean, in general, I I think I I. I, I want to sharply distinguish the, the kind of causal history of addiction from how we ought to treat addiction. So I think addiction does seem to have a causal history that's more bound up with adverse life experiences, maybe, um, than, than blindness and deafness are. Although, of course, tons and tons of people have addictions without having any, or, I mean, Everyone has some adverse life experiences, but without having what clinicians call adverse experiences. And conversely, a lot of people go the other way. So I think the etiology of addiction um, is kind of poorly understood. Um, but I think even granting that, it doesn't impact the claim that addiction is a disability. I think, I think addiction is a disability in the ways I described. And we should just say, well, some, some addictions have this more complicated some disabilities have this more complicated um, etiology uh, 
um, but they should still nonetheless be treated both like in the law and clinically as disabilities. So that's how I would uh, respond to these sort of considerations. Okay, cool. That that makes sense. Then with that in mind, let's kind of unpack what the implications are. And yeah, I would like to sort of, if we can, tie it back that you said how in the moral failing view of addiction, yeah. addiction is a matter of the courts, then in the kind of disease view, it was a matter of medical facilities. And so what institutions <laughs> job is it? And yeah, and just say more about that. Yeah, I really like that framing. In a way, we go back to the courts. I mean, that's that's the big picture thing is like we begin in the so this is this is super, you know, broad sketch, but I but I like this way of framing it. Um, we begin it as it were in the criminal courts where people are punished for their wrongdoing and offer excuses and all this thing one does in the criminal courts. We move from so that's the I guess pre 20th century, although in many it's still the uh, it's still the case in many places in the world and, and and in the United States, people are still treated this way, but that's how it used to be for everyone. We move then to the hospitals. So from the criminal courts to the hospitals, which is kind of the, the hospitals and the clinics or the home of the disease model. Um, uh, so, so we move as it were in the addiction model back into the civil courts. So it's to the civil courts and the legislatures. So people with, so again, thinking about, again, drawing a lot on disability. So, and their blindness, kind of occupy I don't know the history as well but blindness has a similar narrative where back in prehistory I think maybe used to physical disabilities were seen as moral failings I think we we all now see that view as sort of a morally abhorrent but I think some ancient civilizations used to have it and then blindness was seen as a, as a sort of medical thing to be treated by um to be treated by doctors and of course doctors have a role there um but now we think oh, be, blind people are just citizens and they have certain rights um, they have they have certain needs uh, that are maybe different from those of people who are not blind, and so we have laws to enforce their rights. But they have political organizations to represent them, um, and they vote as we all do. Um, and it's sort of a issue of you know basically you up it happens in the legislatures, and then when the legislatures fail, we have the civil courts and other legal mechanisms to enforce the rights of blind people. So I think of addiction in much the same way, moving from the hospitals back to the courts, now the civil courts primarily, and legislatures. So so stating and enforcing the rights of people with addictions. That's how I think of the, of the as it were, the movement uh, uh, of, of that narrative. Okay. And how, okay, so that's who sort of the onus of responsibility is on. How, let's go now, if let's say for an addict, how does this help someone? How is this a better form of treatment? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, so it's, a, so I think it's a very much open question. So the, so let me say a couple of things. So the, the point of the book is, is to say, is to offer a kind of big, you know, a broad view of what addiction is. That's not, that's sort of an alternative to the disease model and one that's well grounded, I think in the law, as well as in philosophy. Um, so a couple of questions are kind of what is it, what is it, as you quite point out, what does it do for people with addictions? Um, I think there are a couple of questions here. One, like, what does the clinical work look like if we take the disability model? Actually, what does treatment look like? Should it look different? I mean, I think there's some concrete ways in which it looks quite different. So involuntary um, treatment, which is practiced in Massachusetts, uh, under section 35 looks a lot less sympathetic on this sort of picture. So, so big picture things about um, treatment, like we should be much, much more reluctant about treatments that infringe on the rights of people. Um, uh, can I ask you to, I, I, can I ask you to impact what those are for people? I, I myself don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a Massachusetts specific thing. It happens in other States, but Massachusetts is one of the few States um, where you can, and it doesn't happen that often, to be honest, but it does happen where people can be involuntarily committed, you know, due to the concerns of their family and friends to treatment. Yeah. Um, for So in most states in the U.S., you can do that only for suicide risk and things like that. In Massachusetts and a few other states, you can do that for addiction treatment. It's a very controversial sort of policy. Um, and and so I mean the the big picture view, like is this view I mean is is very reluctant to endorse anything like that that the addicted people are people with with rights which maybe we should have 
acknowledge even if we don't accept my view, but the view sort of hammers that home that addicted people are people with rights that should be infringed only um, in very rare circumstances. And so it's very unsympathetic to sort of involuntary treatment, things like that. It's very sympathetic to making things available that are useful. So this, so e-cigarettes and vaping is one example that are sometimes banned in some places because of somewhat, you know, you know, concerns about about health hazards. But this view is very sympathetic to pe giving people access to all the all the things that they might want in order to manage, say, a nicotine addiction. Um, so it's very, very sympathetic with kind of respecting people's rights and giving people's access to the tools they need. Beyond that, I think it's it's quite open and like what actually addiction treatment looks like under a disability model. Maybe it looks a lot like what we already have. Maybe it looks radically different. I think it's yet to be explored and it's yet to be explored also. I mean, a big thing about this view is like how do addicted people themselves feel about this view? I mean, I think the view is in a way answerable to people with addictions. And as I say in the book, if people with addictions consider this book, this view carefully and say, no, we don't care for this. We don't like this. This does not represent who we are. Um, then I say so much the worse for the view. So the view is really offered in the first place to people with addictions being like, does this seem right to you? Um, and, and hopefully it does. Um, but if it doesn't, I think that's a serious objection to the view. So the view is ultimately beholden to the judgments of people with addictions themselves. I was actually going to ask that near the end of this. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, no, no, it's okay. No, no, it's okay. It's fine. I was going to, I, I was going to actually ask, like, whether it's in your practice, talking to people, have you actually like presented this book or theory or ideas to um, people who suffer from addictions? And what has that kind of, um, how has the reception been? Yeah, so mixed, I'd say. I'd say decidedly mm. mixed. I, I, I mean, it's it's tough because I think people have like the word disability maybe doesn't have the best. I, like a lot of people have, I guess, negative associations with that word. And so when mm. when you say, and and that's maybe coming from a place of ableism or coming from other places. And so it's tough to get like a neutral evaluation of the view. Um, and so I find my my. My rough experience is when I describe the view in one sentence, people are like, oh, I don't know, I don't know about that. But when I give when I give them a couple paragraphs or or the book, uh, if they read the book, then they're they're more sympathetic. Um, so I think people, um, people, you know, it it depends how deeply the 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 view is described. But I guess we don't know yet. As I say in the conclusion, you know, I myself have a history of alcohol um, abuse disorder, alcohol addiction. Um, and I, I like the view, I like the view, <laughs> but, but I'm just one, I'm just one person. I, I, I do think my view matters, but I think it's, it's not dispositive. And so, um, and so one, one wants a critical mass of people, uh, but some people do, some people don't. So I think it's, I think the jury's out, I'd say. Okay, fair. Well, let's now, let's then kind of get into the nitty gritty. I wanted to kind of explore a few, I thought very interesting points you made throughout it. One thing specifically, you know, I will, I will be, I will now reveal for myself is that I am one to really binge like kind of like self-help personal development content. And I must say, I've actually pretty sympathetic to the idea that in a way you're sort of object to, which is that things like um, perfectionism, things like excessive exercise, things that are in not just normal, but relatively high doses can be considered healthy, can be, to use your word in the book, valorized in the case of perfectionism. You very much say like, that's not what you're talking about here. That is not addiction. So I just found that very interesting. So can you unpack this claim of like how th this kind of term you hear a lot of how like perfectionism is just a form of addiction, over-exercise is a form of addiction, how that doesn't quite jive with your theory of addiction? Yeah, definitely. So, so I guess the background view, and this is picking up on your earlier question of what kind of addiction is it? Is, I mean, the background view is we have these wills. Um, so we have these wills that kind of transcend sort of calculation of, of mm -hmm. particular outcomes. We have, we make certain choices. We have certain tendencies. Some of us are really stubborn. Some of us are really relaxed. There's a great diversity in the human will, which is kind of a, a, mm -hmm. a big thing. And, and I think some of these forms of, of willing are, are, as I say, valorized, I think certainly, uh, you know, you know, certain forms of, you know, perfectionism, as you say, um, other sort of quirky tendencies of the will or what one might see as quirky tendencies of the will 
um, get get valorized, and that's that's well and good. I'm I'm, a, I'm in favor of valorizing certain people's um, tendencies. So where does addiction come from? Like, what is addiction above and beyond that? Mm. Addiction above and beyond. People with addiction are subject to systematic and deep seated discrimination and exploitation um, of a degree that's like qualitative. I mean, uh, uh, just a shocking degree, especially to the degree to which people are out loud about it. So, you know, you'll ask people, would you allow your child to marry someone um, of an opposite race? And they'll, and a lot of people now will say, yes, not everyone. And the actual number is probably lower because people can lie on these sorts of surveys. Mm -hmm. um, but but people are, are now a bit more open-minded about it than they were, say, 50 years ago. Would you allow your child to marry someone with an addiction history? The numbers are incredibly, are incredibly low. People are still openly discriminatory against people with with addictions would you rent a room to someone with addiction history people are still incredibly low numbers there's like widespread and sort of and it's sort of like socially still okay to say it in a way that it's not as much at least in in some contexts with race um or gender that people are openly discriminatory uh, of of addiction so what is addiction it's a mix of a certain tendency of the will and a certain pattern of discrimination and exploitation. So going back to your examples, what I, I think most of those things you're describing are things that are kind of tendencies of the will and from a psychological point of view, kind of structurally analogous to the mechanisms of addiction, but are not subject to the same kind of discrimination and exploitation. And that's why people will ask me, is workaholism an addiction? And I think people do, you know, have have real tendencies towards work that are that are structurally you know analogous to things that people have with addiction what makes workaholism not an addiction is that it's not subject to the same forces of discrimination and exploitation um indeed often at least in certain contexts the opposite i see so so addiction is to have these i'll use the term in the book uh i think volitional differences to have um some kind of somewhat particular quirks of your will or volitional system plus to be the object of stigma it's those two things together that equals kind of addiction in your view is that correct precisely yeah precisely okay that, that i think that helps a lot so um one thing that so then just to unpack that, let's imagine a world where we have really overcome these stigmas. Um, you know, we're very far from that to your point, I imagine, but like in in that kind of world, how are we speaking about, uh, to not rely on the word again, people who have volitional differences that results in them kind of taking excessive, you know, alcohol, drug use, like how, how would we talk about that in this kind of hypothetical society or world? Yeah, and it, and so, you know, it's hard to say because it's hard to yeah. say what what these kind of factuals how to think about them. We have a kind of a slight picture of this. I mean, on this view, so exploitation, I guess, is really distinctive to addiction. I think all mm. all differences or all all sort of minority differences are or a lot of them are subject to discrimination, but exploitation seems especially connected with addiction. So we've created these products. If you think of the case of tobacco. So cigarettes, which are like designed as a machine for exploiting addiction and people will smoke, you know, one pack a day and it's, you know, just the right size and just the right price. So tobacco addiction used to be less subject to these sorts of things. So tobacco addiction in the 18th century obviously was a thing, um, but it was not as systematically exploited. So maybe, I don't know the literature on this, so maybe the health outcomes were not quite as, as profound. It's hard to know because... 18th century, yeah. a lot of other things going on. Right, right. Um, but gambling addiction is another one I talk about a lot. Gambling addiction mm -hmm. now seems to be one where it's like, you know, I think people did lose fortunes in the 18th century gambling, but the ease with which one can do that uh, in the 21st century, especially with gambling apps, is sort of like unprecedented in human history. So as a as a as a first pass question, what would this like look like without discrimination and exploitation? Well. One could look, you know, a few hundred, a few hundred years back, where we didn't have quite the same technologies of exploitation, um, and it would look maybe a little more like that. Um, 
what would it look like without the discrimination? That's that's harder to say. That's kind of always been with us uh, and feels intractable, at least sometimes. Um, so, but at first approximation, that's what it might look like. But but it but it's hard to say how to know how to how to think about these counterfactuals. That's actually a great um, transition to the next question I wanted to ask. Actually, so I'm, I'm glad you took my counterfactual and brought it there, which is this was a nuanced discussion, which was how does this theory of addiction as a volitional disability or disability of the will, how does that cash out in terms of prohibition versus legalization? And I just, I sort of give my, why this is interesting to me is that I feel like, you know, since my days in college and people are sort of like experimenting, it was, there's always the talk of how, you know, Portugal had legalized all their drugs and how is that good or bad and how much are we focused on helping people who currently suffer from addiction versus how much are we in mass trying to prevent addiction from starting? So how does this whole theory cash out in this whole legalization versus prohibition question? Yeah. And as you say, so it's a, it's a, it's a difficult, it's a difficult and subtle question. Yeah. And, so, and so here's my, so I, I, I think I come from a place of, of wanting, you know, people giving people lots of options and especially people with addiction. So I gave the example of vaping earlier. There's debates in the in the U.S. and other countries about whether vaping and e-cigarettes should be legal. And I think, of course, of course they should. Like these are such a, these are such a great um, accommodation for people. So I like offering people um, what I call accommodations, kind of borrowing on the uh, uh, literature on the broader literature on disability. Um, also very much against criminal penalties. I think people, people who, at least people who use substances um, should not be criminalized, crimin criminally penalized or put in jails. And so I, I accept decriminalization in some sense of that term. That term gets used in different ways, but at least in mm -hmm. some sense of that term, um, I'm very sympathetic with it. But, but I do think that um, certain technologies, as I say, have grown up that are kind of especially designed to exploit the tendencies of people with addictions. In the book, I call them anti-accommodations. Mm. So an accommodation is something like a wheelchair ramp or a curb cut that kind of makes life easier for people with disabilities and for everyone else, to be honest. These accommodations tend to be good things for everyone. Um, and 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 I, I'm all in favor of those, obviously, and I'm all in favor of making, making say, vapes accept, more accessible. But I think they're also anti-accommodations. They're, I think, gambling apps are a very clear example where you know, 20 years ago, if you wanted to gamble, in, indeed, if you wanted to gamble all your savings, you could do it. You could go to Las Vegas or you could, mm -hmm. you could somehow manage to do it. Um, uh, now it's much easier. One can do it, you know, in a few minutes. Um, and that's an anti-accommodation. That is a device that, that makes life much, much harder for people mm -hmm. with, with gambling addictions. And it does so not for the heck of it, but in order to exploit those people for profits of generally of large corporations. Um, cigarettes, I think are another example. Hard alcohol, which we're so used to now, we're all used mm -hmm. to like, you know, 80 proof alcohol being a standard way of socializing with each other. But it's that's like a recently designed anti-accommodation in the last couple hundred years, um, these like highly refined alcohols. So, uh, so I am, I'm in favor of finding some way, at least as long as certain conditions are a matter of, pro of prohibiting these things, generally prohibiting the, the manufacture and sale of them. So I'm, I'm comfortable with criminal penalties on people who manufacture and sell these items if needed, um, rather than on people who use them. But I, it, so it's, so, and it's to protect the rights of the minority. I think when people say advocate pro pro prohibiting cigarettes, for example, they point out that public health benefits would be better, and they probably would. Um, that's not the argument here. The argument is to protect the rights of a class of people, of a subclass of people, people with, with addictions or addictive tendencies. All of us should forsake certain things. So alcohol, again, is a great example. I think for most people, having a martini occasionally is a nice thing. Um, but when we think about prohibiting the sale of like spirits, the manufacture and sale of spirits, that's would be a case of a majority giving up certain privileges in order to protect the rights of a minority. So that's the structure um, of the arguments, not because it would 
be a public health benefit, although it probably would, but it could, because it would protect the rights of minority against exploitation and discrimination. So that's 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 the general shape of the view. I see. So it really is what you're trying to optimize for here is helping these people who have a disability that makes them vulnerable to these kinds of substances. Yeah, and I think even up, yeah, optimizing. I mean, it's, it's right. Uh, so optimization is the language of of kind of benefit, and this is this is the language of rights. I think there are people. Fair, are, fair, fair. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, but it's an it's it's an important it's a nice distinction. So it's like yeah, I think there are certain people who have certain rights. And even if it would be great for all of us, even if maybe if unbalanced, it would be better if we could have an occasional martini. Still, the the nature of these rights prohibitions is they're they're not concerned with like overall well being, at least not primarily. They're concerned with certain people having certain rights, and and those rights need to be enforced. So that's the structure of the argument. Yeah, it's a funny. It's so so then, it's 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 the right of someone to live in an environment where they don't have to be subject. To these forms of ex I think exploitation is the key term here. That's what kind of makes it work. Yeah. I see. So it's a form of exploitation. Okay, that that makes sense. I then I would just ask like, are you sort of bring this up in passing? Like, are things like I don't know, video game addiction are those going to be sort of case by case? Sort of like you know, social media addiction is talked about a lot. Is that going to be sort of like more of a not hard and fast legalized versus prohibit view, but a more nuanced discussion? Yeah, they they are case by case, and those two cases seem to be quite. Um, I mean, video game addiction. I think the 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 case is getting quite strong for treating that as a as some form of addiction. I mean, and the mm -hmm. the exploitation there is there. The the really negative life outcomes are there. So I'm not. I mean, I think this is. I I I think we have a lot of addictions that are more like cigarettes, for example, which are still like sold everywhere. Like there we there are a lot of us that were low hanging fruit before we got to before we got to video game addiction. But I think um uh there's a strong case there for treating that as an addiction and maybe making policy implications. Social media addiction is a really tough one. And I guess I'm not sure what to think about it. I mean, because it's one of these where most people, I don't know, I don't know if it's 50%, but I bet it's 50%, at least a lot of people use social media or certainly certainly if you broaden it to phone use to phone addiction um uh so it, it doesn't seem to be discriminated against in the same way although there is there is certainly the element of exploitation certainly so i'm not quite sure where where social medias or phones fit on this spectrum or what sort of policy implications this has but video games i think um there's a strong case for putting them on the side of on the side of cigarettes and alcohol and things like that Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that that makes sense. Those are, we're still sort of getting the data right. Um, yeah, yeah. I think these are also one. these are also new, and we're and like we're still like I, I, the the nice thing about this 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 the slowness of the moral arc. I mean, it is very interesting to think about video games and phones and things like this. But like we're still working on like tobacco and alcohol, which have been around for a while, and so we're still figuring out the the proper policy uh, uh, treatment of these. So. So, so yeah, we're still figuring out video games and phones as well. What about to give one more species of example? Yeah, so yeah. we've covered the sort of like, yeah, the, the more complicated cases of like video games and phones. We've covered the classic cases of tobacco and alcohol and gambling. What about, you know, things like that are illegal, but there's, I'm not, I mean, I don't know the data on this, but whether it's like heroin or cocaine, I mean, anecdotally speaking, or not anecdotally, when here's the news, there's a lot of problems, like, you hear about the opioid crisis all the time. So what about those things that are illegal, but are still pernicious? Like what's the right way to handle those things within um, within this framework of giving rights to people who suffer from this addiction disability? Yeah, I can speak to a bit uh, to opiates, which is a case I, I know slightly better. So it's, so I think the general view is first of all, protect is, is offering people with with opiate use disorders the accommodations that they need for example and so we have great accommodations for opiate use disorders we have medications like suboxone which are still stigmatized in certain places but are incredibly effective um in the treatment of of opiate use disorders and so obviously this view is you know it's up to the people with themselves whether they want to avail themselves of this accommodation but uh, this view is strongly in favor of making these widely available and then in the case of opiates we also have what we have in the case of cigarettes and tobacco which is these highly refined exploitative 
uh, technologies. Indeed, we're seeing this a lot in the U.S. Uh, and other countries with fentanyl. Um, and indeed, the opiates, you know, the opiate crisis, I think, is in a way, as people, as journalists have documented, an effect of these technologies like OxyContin, which are maybe were technologies that were designed for a good purpose, but then were, that were that then were kind of like turned to a to a much darker purpose and had really profound negative effects. So I think the opiate crisis is like support for this view of seeing like addiction as driven by discrimination and exploitation. The view supports making accommodations like Suboxone as freely available as possible and restricting anti-accommodations on the supply side rather than on the demand side, like fentanyl and stuff like this. Whether one could get, whether there's some things in between, you know, I guess people used to smoke opium in some in some way that was less harmful than it is now. I don't know what to think about those cases, but the view is very clear on how we should think of, it's very pro making Suboxone widely available and maybe, and very pro, and very against fentanyl in favor of strong prohibitions on the manufacture and sale of fentanyl and things like this, which we already have, but enforcing those even more strongly. I see, that's good. So I see, so having this kind of like, yeah, this, preserving the rights of people suffering from addictions, minimizing exploitation does provide us a good way to think about all these kind of tricky issues that we hear about. That's that's great. I want to ask, this is, I'm kind of straight far from, I'm, you've got me very interested. So for all the readers, not all these questions are covered in the book. So let, I wanted to ask, um, so I asked earlier about how have addicts themselves responded to this. One thing I'm, you know, it hasn't happened in my own life really, but one thing I'm very conscious of is that family members of addicts, I mean, that's a really, it's very hard. Like these, so how have, have you talked to anyone who is not an addict themselves, but has been deeply affected, whether it's a child of an addict, the spouse of an addict, whatever it might be, how have they responded to this kind of discussion? Yeah, I have, I have talked to people and this has, and this question's come up and I think it's a, I think it's a really important question. I mean, so and the book and the book doesn't really doesn't really address it. I mean, so I mean, we know that I mean, people with people who are in loving with their family or romantic relationships with people with addictions face a distinct set of challenges. And there are great organizations that are devoted towards people. So notably, notably Al Anon. Uh, which, which, which some listeners might be familiar with, which is a, a kind of a twelve-step program, kind of a sister program to Alcoholics Anonymous, but the members of Al-Anon are people who have a loved one in their lives mm -hmm. um, with an addiction or with an alcohol addiction. In the case of Al-Anon, um, um, uh, so, so there's a so there's a distinct set of issues that people with addictions face, and people. So, how does this view look? I mean. I think the response that I've gotten to people who've raised this or people who have themselves of having a loved one with with an addiction is kind of a bit like what I was describing earlier with people with addictions, which is when I give them one sentence, they're like, oh, I don't really buy that. And when yeah. I give them a couple of paragraphs, then they're like, oh, okay, maybe I can get there, get my head around it. But I mean, it's but 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 one would want a more developed answer. I think it's it's one of the many areas in which I think the the kind of the the view on this articulate in the book the details could be or a whole uh framework could be more more fully developed um um because it seems to be people with in relationships with people with addiction seem to be subject to a certain sort of you know, harm or or a certain a certain sort of stress um that maybe people with people with uh uh who have loved ones who have physical disabilities don't have the analogous experience it seems specific Mm -hmm. to the case of addiction so what is it about addiction that gives rise to these particular experiences and how does the disability view speak to it it's really it's, it feels to me a really important question um that's kind of that's kind of left open for the book by the book so it's something people other people have asked me and it seems really important and something i'd like to uh i'd like to think more about well ideas for a future book yeah well this has been great i want to say because it's a very you know humane book any final messages you want to give for our audience um uh no final messages uh well i guess final messages is, is yeah I, uh, thank you this has been such a helpful has been such a helpful interview i really 
I'm really, especially for people with uh, a history of addiction, be it in their in their families or in their own lives, I'm I want to reiterate something I've already said, which is really this is sort of this is a proposal. It's not, and books are often presented as here's my book and here's my argument and here's why it's true, which is, a, you know, there there's certain social pressures to do this. This book is not quite offered in that spirit. It's offered as a hypothesis to be verified by people themselves. So if you're someone with addiction or or loved one with addiction, have a look at this book and if and think is it true. And if it's not, and if you don't think it's true, please let me know. Why not? That would be great. Um, but to kind of make up your own mind on it, and I'll be interested to hear. Um, what people think of because this is ultimately offered to people with addictions as a proposal that they might accept, but they also might not accept. So I welcome feedback. Okay, well, and with that note of humility, John, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. It's really been fun. 